Hi all, this is Ben and welcome back to the Uncharted X channel. I've just returned from a recent trip to Egypt, and while spending a day up on the Giza Plateau, I was shown something that, simply put, blew my mind. And it's something that I think should have a significant impact on our understanding of ancient Egyptian history. And it's the first thing I wanted to share with you all from this trip. Piecing together the story of history is a hard job, and the further back in time we go, the more difficult it gets. One of the real challenges is in how we date and relate ancient monuments and stonework. Primarily, this is done by any writing or inscriptions that we find on or around stone objects. For example, the name of kings or other historical figures. From other written sources, we have a general idea of the time frame and periods in which these historical figures lived. So when it comes to stone artifacts, if it has one guy's name on it, then we make the general judgement that that's the guy who had it made. In the absence of any other evidence or context, this approach is a good general indicator for dating, but obviously it can be fraught with problems. Not the least of which is one of my favourite topics, that, in terms of stonework, the writing on many of these objects does not remotely reflect the technology that's gone into making the object itself. How can you confidently state that the same industry or the same people who made this giant single piece granite box with its perfect lines and precision cut corners were also responsible for the chicken scratch writing that's all over it, unable to even get close to a straight line? Yet, this box, and indeed the entire subterranean complex that it's housed in, called the Serapium, is dated and related into our story of history precisely because of this writing. The concept of inheritance, that some of the precision-made objects like boxes, slabs, statues and obelisks, could be vastly ancient, with primitive, hand-chiseled writing added in only later periods, is a legitimate possibility that is sadly generally ignored by mainstream academia. I think mostly this is because they don't want to deal with the implications that this possibility has on our current version of orthodox history, that we could possibly be missing entire chapters of advanced human civilization that existed long before our current known ancient cultures, like the Sumerians, the Egyptians, or the Mesopotamians. If you're interested in more details and examples of this technological gap, I've explored the concept in a number of videos. Take a look at my Serapium series or the Evidence for Ancient High Technology playlist. Today I want to talk about a different challenge when it comes to dating stonework, that of stone recycling within the dynastic Egyptian civilization itself. We're going to get into some new information that, at least in my opinion, presents a serious problem to our understanding of the earliest periods of human civilization as we know it. Stone recycling, or the repurposing of stone artifacts in dynastic Egypt, is not a controversial idea at all. It's a well-recognized practice that's acknowledged by academia, although they don't seem to put much importance onto it. In fact, today, some of the pharaohs that we consider to be the greatest or most powerful of all of the ancient Egyptian rulers largely have that reputation because they've reclaimed, reused or renamed many of the great works from earlier periods, roughly chiseling their names into them, and we still give them credit for it. Ramses II, known as Ramses the Great, who is widely acknowledged in academia as the most powerful of Egyptian pharaohs, along with his son Meren Ptah, were notorious for this practice, and they certainly weren't alone. Flinders Petrie labelled Ramses the Great Usurper, and you can find his name deeply carved into all sorts of obviously more ancient artefacts like statues, obelisks or granite slabs. At Tanis, there is a large part of what once was an obelisk, later repurposed by Ramses as a block in a wall, where you can literally see how the older writing was being erased, and Ramses' cartouche being deeply carved into it. In this case, the older work, the bird, as well as the lines that are above and below it, are of a much finer quality than Ramses' rough chiselling. He did make sure to carve his name deeply though, I suspect in order to make it that much more difficult to erase it when later generations engaged in the same practice as indeed they did. 
If you take a close look at many of the huge single-piece statues, for example those still standing at Luxor, which we all today attribute to Ramses, you can see the obvious evidence for the much later addition of the inscriptions. Let's take a closer look at this group of granite statues at Luxor. Note the fine details of the skirt and the dagger that is carved onto the belt line. On some of the statues, the dagger is in the middle, so there's no inscription. On two of them, however, the dagger is slightly offset, so Ramses had his name added here, and you can clearly see how the inscription was carved over part of the dagger. The inscription came later. It was not part of the original design, and any close inspection will reveal the obvious differences in the carving of the inscription versus the carving of the fine details like the skirt and the dagger. It's just not the same industry, the same process, the same people, or the same technology. This particular statue also bears multiple names, that of Ramses II on the belt line and Meren Ptah in between the legs. I think Ramses had these columns and the whole temple constructed around these statues, and they've likely been here for a very long time. But anyway, that big, that whatever it is, we can see here that the name came on top of it. The name of Ramses II in the cartoon is on top of the carbon and on top of the kilt itself. While here they didn't do it because the, the shape that looks like a dagger is in the middle, oh. so they didn't bother carving it on it, but here they did it. Huh? You'll see that? You can do it in the I, Tomorrow, uh, when we go to Karnak, I will show you. This is a restoration, you see? Yeah. Oh. See that? The... What's the restoration? The, the belts in the middle, so they didn't oh, carve yeah, over it on this yeah, one, but this head was falling. the belt that here is head also was falling down. slightly offset, yeah. and they carved uh, the cartouche the over the top of the carving of, also, uh, of the dagger. So it tells you the cartoon came later. Like, look at the knee cap. Look how well this polished. Oh, yeah. Huh? Here we can see again the name of Merim Pitah. That one here, and the between the legs, and the name of Ramses II here. So you have two the different sets of names. statue doesn't look like any of them. Nah. I live streamed my visit to Luxor on the last trip to Egypt, so if you're interested in a longer exploration of this site, check out that video on the Uncharted X channel. As I mentioned earlier, the recycling of stone, or the reclaiming of older objects, wasn't just something that a few rulers engaged in, it became almost common practice in ancient Egypt. This so-called Hyksos Sphinx, with its incredible detailing and polished surface, has been quite frankly defaced with rough chiseled inscriptions, and it bears the name of not one, but three different pharaohs, all from different time periods. Who's to say exactly when this artifact was made? You might also notice that yet again, the rough work of this writing doesn't seem to remotely resemble or be similar to the obvious precision and technology that was used to create the statue itself. This massive granite foot, found at the site of Tanis, is part of what might have been the largest single piece stone statue ever made by human hands. I have a video on it specifically if you want to check it out, but this foot has been cut and shortened on either end of it in order to simply repurpose it as a block in a wall. No one really knows when this statue was made or by who, but the wall that it was later repurposed into, which was made up of all the other blocks you can find here, did indeed have inscriptions that were quite obviously added later. Yet despite this clear evidence of repurposing, we still date this site by these inscriptions. That statue might well have been there, either whole or in broken pieces, for thousands of years before Ramses ever repurposed its foot as a simple block in a wall. Even the famous Dream Stele, the inscribed granite stone that sits between the front legs of the Sphinx at Giza, the one that tells the story of Thutmose IV, how he fell asleep in the shade of the Sphinx's head and it spoke to him in a dream, telling him to clear it of sand and that he would become king. Even this stele is a recycled piece of Old Kingdom granite. It was originally part of another structure at Giza, one from the Old Kingdom, and it was taken from its original location, moved to the Sphinx, and then carved with inscriptions at the beginning of the New Kingdom period. 
Perhaps there is no better example of the recycling of stone than that which we can find at the Middle Pyramid Complex, also at Giza. This mighty pyramid, once called the Great Pyramid by the Egyptians themselves, or the Mountain of the West, is attributed to Pharaoh Khafre of the 4th Dynasty. I have part 1 of a two-part series on the Middle Pyramid out on my channel if you want to know more about this remarkable complex. The pyramid's lower two courses were cased in not limestone, but in granite, literally hundreds and hundreds of multi-ton precision cut blocks transported to Giza from the quarries of Aswan in Upper Egypt, nearly a thousand kilometers distant. Nowadays, only a few of these blocks are still in their original spot, yet thousands of tons of granite rubble surrounds the pyramid, the leftovers of quarrying and recycling that tourists today can pick their way through. This quarrying is not a modern phenomena, although it did continue on down into modern times right down to the 19th century. It was started by the ancient Egyptians themselves, and they left inscriptions boasting about it. On the northern wall of the enclosure around the pyramid, you can find an inscription describing the activities of the quarry master, who was taking granite from this pyramid in order for Ramses II to repurpose it in other structures. And, indeed, granite from this pyramid is found in many of these structures on other sites that are attributed to Ramses. Okay, so what conclusions can we draw from this? Well, for one thing, it seems like all this Old Kingdom work was much, much finer than the rulers of the later periods could manage, and perhaps taking cut stone from existing monuments was far easier than quarrying and shaping the blocks yourself. There's all sorts of logical issues with this idea, by the way. The idea that, according to our mainstream story of history, the Egyptians peaked in capability in the earliest times, building giant precision pyramids and shaping millions of tons worth of huge granite blocks, like these blocks in the incredible Valley Temple. And then somehow the Egyptian civilization seems to have degraded over time, losing that capability. That's simply not how civilizations work, but it is precisely what we're expected to believe when it comes to ancient Egypt. Remember this point, as we're coming back to it shortly. For now, let's just assume that all of these recycled stone blocks were in fact manufactured during the Old Kingdom. That is exactly how mainstream academia views the practice of stone recycling, that it all happened in the Middle and New Kingdoms, with the kings from those periods taking from Old Kingdom sites and structures. So what if we found evidence for this same practice of stone recycling, but during the Old Kingdom itself? The early period that was supposedly responsible for all of the precision stonework, the pillars, the columns, and the millions of tons of cut granite. Well, that's exactly what I was shown on my recent trip to Egypt by my good friend, stonemason and expert guide, Yusuf Awan. Here we are. And of course, you and I promised the people on the last uh, podcast that we're going to be doing some of these things yep. live on the site. And this is the tomb of the priest Ra'wer. Ra'wer was a priest that uh, served during the time of Shipsis Kaif. Shipsis Kaif is the successor of Menkaura, the one that we relate the third pyramid here to. We can see the name here. of the king, Shepsis Kaif. So it's the end of the fourth dynasty. The fourth dynasty, according to the official story, is the dynasty that built these pyramids. So according to the official story, recycling stones from the Giza Plateau started on the Middle Kingdom time, and they found the stones reused from the Giza Plateau. They found it used in the pyramids of Elisht, Yep. or Ethid Taweed, as we mentioned before on the video. But this, on the official story, will be the oldest evidence of recycling stone. Here, we are in the first dynasty tomb of Ra'wer, and it was excavated by the Professor Selim Hassan. We can see over there his offering hall. And we can see in this offering hall, if we look over here, the offering tables that he used will, of course, the stone machinery here is reflecting definitely the capability of the first dynasty. But the stones here, huh? we have this one over here. It's a pillar base, yeah. 
this was his offering goal and this as we can see here was one of the offering tables but the professor Sirim Hassan mentions that this is a very odd shape for an offering table because we are never used to see them around like this I recognize this very well this is a base of a pillar yeah and obviously it was being reused in this structure here so the base of the pillar will be from this part lower underground and only this part will be above the ground and then the pillar was going to be on top of it we can see even part of a circle here that is a different color because the pillar here stayed for a long time you see the different colors between here yeah and here it's a calcite build up when the water so is warm. yeah that's a base of a this is an evidence of recycling here also uh, to give you more evidence here you can see that this is perfectly round okay you see that yeah yeah show that it's perfectly round now if you would follow me <coughs> Anubis. Anubis. <laughs> the guardian. <laughs> Here we can see the, another base of a pillar that was used also as an offering table. But look here. The circle is not complete. Is it clear? It is clear. Yeah. That that the circle it, here it. Yeah. was carved. Why? To put the depiction mm. of the priest. And we can see here the inscription and his name down here. Ra. Well, this is the priest from the fourth dynasty. Fourth dynasty. Yes. Yeah. So here we have a conclusive evidence that shows that stone was being recycled since the old kingdom time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Begs the question: Where was it being? Yeah. Recycled from, yeah, from, from that what structure? So, what can we make of this? It's quite clear, these offering table in Ra Wurz Hall are recycled pillar or column bases made from white calcite. You can find similar bases at several Old Kingdom sites, including here at Giza, as well as at Saqqara and Abu Sir. These ones are made of granite and there are still two of these single piece palm shaped pillars standing on top of them. At these sites, once there were literally dozens of these types of columns. Most all of them now have been destroyed or recycled. This type of stone, the white calcite of the bases in Ra Wur's offering hall, is also called alabaster, or sometimes travertine, and it's one of the primary stone types used by the megalithic builders. The same combination of stones, white calcite, granite, basalt, and limestone. You see these same stone types wherever you find massive precision megalithic work. Although alabaster was particularly prized by the recyclers and the quarrymen, as it's softer than granite, it's easier to work, and it has its unique white colouring, there are still many other examples of original white calcite blocks. There is a huge chunk of it still in the ground beneath the original floor level of the mortuary temple at the middle pyramid complex. Unfortunately, this looks recently damaged to me. Some kid was probably hammering on it with something, but you can see the crystalline structure of the sedimentary layers in the stone. This type of stone is quarried from deep within natural springs, and getting large single piece blocks out of it like these is no easy process. The floor of the valley temple is made from white calcite. It's been repaired with concrete in places, but much of the original work is still visible and preserved, along with the rest of the valley temple, largely thanks to being buried in sand during recent millennia. In the same structure, you can also find huge megalithic precision cut blocks of white calcite, making up the walls of these closed off alcoves. These alcoves are to the left and right of the passage that leads up to the Sphinx viewing platform. I've never heard of them being opened, and I suspect that once they led to staircases that went up to the second level of the Valley Temple, which is now gone. 
The contrast between the valuable alabaster blocks and the granite is very noticeable. And make sure you do take a peek in these alcoves if you're ever here in the Valley Temple, as most people just walk right past them on their way up to looking at the Sphinx. Another example, perhaps my favourite one, is the incredible Hotep that's at the Old Kingdom Sun Temple site of Abu Ghraib. An amazing piece, made up from several large blocks of white calcite. It clearly reflects the use of power tools and machining in its construction. Also on that site you can find the famous so-called bowls, very mysterious objects carved from huge single piece blocks of white calcite and replete with tube drill holes and machined surfaces. There is evidence that these were once sheathed in copper and connected to pipes that ran through the large holes in each bowl. Perhaps they once connected up to the underground system of channeled blocks that we can also find on these Old Kingdom sites. My point here is that white calcite is obviously amongst the combination of stones used by the original builders, those who did all of the massive precision work. And given the evidence that these pieces were recycled in the 4th dynasty, it seems to suggest that some of the stonework here may have been there for a long, long time before the Old Kingdom. I think the best way to frame this evidence, as Yusuf put it, conclusive evidence, of stone recycling in the 4th dynasty, is to consider what it means for our orthodox story of history. If we say that the 4th dynasty, or the Old Kingdom in general, built these sites and everything on it, then the idea that these stones were immediately recycled for use as offering tables makes no sense at all. The first offering table in Rawur's Hall that we saw still has a visible depression and calcite buildup, likely from a pillar that was standing on it for a very long time, and it was only after this time that it was repurposed as an offering table. I'm sure that the mainstream would dismiss Rawur's offering hall as simply an anomaly that isn't worth explaining. But to me, this evidence represents yet another glaring and illogical contradiction to our mainstream story of history. That list of contradictions is getting pretty long at this point. The idea that the Old Kingdom dynastic Egyptians built everything on Old Kingdom sites with nothing more than pounding stones, flint and copper chisels, and human labour just does not match up to the evidence that we can observe. All of these contradictions, and indeed the example of Ra Wur's 4th Dynasty Offering Hall, can be far more rationally and elegantly explained by this simple concept of inheritance, of longer timelines, and of a lost ancient civilization with advanced technology that is unknown to us today. This concept is supported by the myths and legends of ancient peoples around the world, who speak of times when gods or advanced peoples walked the earth, and their ancestors were struck down by flood or fire, and civilization was forced to begin again. It's supported by a myriad of modern science that has emerged over the past 20 years. The discovery of the Younger Dryas Cataclysm and Extinction event some 12,900 years ago. The extension of the human timeline, making us far older than we previously thought and even genetic evidence suggesting that our past is much more complex and intermingled. We have been a global people in the past. It's supported by the evidence we have left to us in ancient maps and in documents, and it's supported by the evidence written into the stone itself. Precise, massive, and functional work that simply cannot be explained by the primitive tools that we know civilizations like the dynastic Egyptians utilized. I really think it's time that the mainstream begins to consider the possibility of inheritance, to take it seriously, and to investigate these sites and artefacts with this context in mind. There is so much we could be doing to further our understanding of the past. There are all sorts of modern technologies, tools, and analysis that we could be applying to these sites and these objects. But just because primitive tools are all that we've found, the mainstream just crams everything into that box and says, case closed. It's a real shame, and it's a real disservice to the principles of their professions. I hope that the next generation of archaeologists and academics will be able to set aside ego, set aside the dogma of history, and to investigate these mysteries with an open mind, as I think there are some real discoveries here still waiting to be made. Thanks for watching.
Hey all, well, I hope you enjoyed that look at some of the evidence for stone recycling that was occurring in the Old Kingdom in the Fourth Dynasty itself. Uh, I was really impressed when I first saw this, when Yusuf showed it to me. I think it's quite compelling. Uh, I think it really does put, put the whole idea that, that the recycling only happened in the Middle and New Kingdoms uh, into question. I think it's some serious evidence that, that means we should really be taking a closer look at what happened in the Old Kingdom and whether or not some of that architecture and stonework existed prior to that. I saw a lot of cool stuff on this last trip to Egypt. Uh, I've got a bit of footage of our visit into the Assyrian playing for you here while I go through this postscript. Uh, I've had a really busy last three months. That's why I haven't been able to produce a whole lot of videos. I was in Peru in August uh, with Brian and Jimmy. Then I was in the Scablands with Randall Carlson uh, in September. And then uh, October, we just had this Egypt trip. So now I'm back from that. I've got my nose down to the grindstone. I intend to be producing a whole bunch of videos. So please do keep your eye on the channel as I expect to be producing quite a bit over the next few months. I want to take a moment here to say a sincere thank you to everybody who does support the channel through that value for value model. It really is the only way that I'm able to take the time to edit, research and, and produce all of these videos. All of this content, anyone can watch it up on YouTube. So I very much do appreciate the people that get some value from, from this work and see fit to return a little bit of that value to me. It really does help me out. So if that value for value model sounds interesting to you and you would like to support my work at Uncharted X, uh, you can find all of the ways to do that listed on my website. It's unchartedx.com slash support. Uh, I've recently added Venmo. I've had a few people request uh, me to add Venmo to it. So I've got an account for that now. Uh, you can find those details there. I do want to say a special thank you to everybody who supports me through channel memberships here on YouTube, uh, on Patreon, and on Subscribestar. And some of these are in smaller amounts, anywhere from a dollar to like nine or ten dollars a month. Uh, you guys really are the backbone of me making this sustainable and, and something that I can continue to do. So a, a big thank you to you guys. Uh, as I've done in previous videos, I haven't really done this since July, I do want to take a little bit of time to also acknowledge people that have signed up for the associate executive producers and executive producer credits for these videos. These are real credits. They work the same way as credits in Hollywood do. Uh, you can use them on things like LinkedIn. They're, they're real credits. It, it's exactly the same thing. And these are for people that sign up uh, to support in, in larger amounts. And it's a way that I can say thank you uh, and give you something back in return. For this particular video, I'm going to be giving double credits. I'm also going to be crediting you guys, the associate execs and exec producers, with the podcast that I'll be releasing shortly. Uh, it's been a little while, so there's a few names here. But starting with the associate executive producers, we have Christopher Pearson, Jin Yuan Lu, Manu Seifazada. Uh, Manu, thank you so much for that uh, for that support. Manu's written a great book. Uh, the forward to it is written by Graham Hancock. It's called Beneath the Sphinx. I bought a copy here. It's, I'd highly recommend it to everybody. Jacques Atlas, Phil Connolly, Greg Cahin, Tara Lee Sanders, William McConnell, Deborah and Richard Shander from the trip in Egypt. Deborah and Richard, I hope you guys are doing well. Dan Monick also from the recent trip to Egypt. Thanks, Dan. Now onto the executive producers, and these are people that have supported me in, in $200 or more in a single donation. Massive thank you to these guys. We have Mohammed Al Subai. Mohammed, thank you so much for your generous support, mate. I really appreciate it. Stuart Backman, Jeanette M. Richal, and Mark Rendina. And Mark was also on the trip with us to Egypt. It was great meeting you, Mark, and look forward to catching up with you again in the near future. I wanted to quickly mention that I do intend to be doing some exclusive content for patrons, for channel members, and for Subscribestar uh, people. I've been doing a little bit of this in the recent past as well. I've done a lot of LiDAR scanning in Peru and in Egypt. I got some outstanding results from this last trip to Egypt. And I've been making all of those available for channel members and supporters uh, on Patreon and Subscribestar. Uh, I do want to also let you know that anyone who does send in support in uh, $50 or more, I do add you all to a mailing list. And then every few months, I send out an email to, to those people who have done that. And I give you access to all of the same sort of exclusive content that I've made for uh, subscribers and, and channel members and patrons and things like that. So if you're interested in any of that, uh, things like the 3D scans, you can, you can basically sign up for a dollar a month if you like and then quit. But you get access to all of that exclusive content. Uh, and I do intend to be doing more of that on a more frequent basis going forward now that I'm, I'm back at home. And uh, one last thing, if you're interested in uh, seeing sort of uh, how the sausage is made, if you like, in some of the editing and a lot of reviewing of kind of the raw footage that I bring back from these sites and, and talking about all of these topics, I do live stream uh, two or three times a week in general uh, over on Twitch. It's twitch.tv slash unchartedx. 
So if you've made it this far into the video, I wanna say a big thank you for watching. I very much appreciate the views and your time, and I hope you're all doing well out there, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.